What a lovely Monday. It's a new world, Eugene. I feel that uh, we've all spent a long time saying that the Oscars don't matter. But this morning it feels nice for those of us who dabble in major motion picture making, doesn't it? And, uh, Everything and everywhere. Everything everywhere. has something all to do once. with that. Everything everywhere all at once. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, congratulations, South By, really, for, uh, for picking a good one. <laughs> Awards can, <clears throat> and forgive my allergy ridden sore throat, uh, I've got my warm water here. Um, Awards can shine a light, and when they shine a light on a film or films that might not otherwise get that attention or that level of attention, that international awareness, we saw it last night at the Oscars, it can really make a difference. And it can be inspiring, instigating. I don't know that, I think maybe the language should change around them. I think the whole best thing doesn't really serve anybody. Maybe portal of the year. <laughs> portal. <laughs> I don't know. Seems appropriate for this film. Yeah, or you know, forum of the year, forum opportunity of the year. <laughs> Why not? That's worth something. It does make a difference. We did this nine uh, nine years ago. Thank you for being back. A lot's happened in nine years. A lot will happen in the next. Um, we're going to talk about it more in depth in a minute, but Problemista is such a special new film that I was able to see recently. I know very few people have seen it yet, and you just want to be there tonight to see this movie. It's something unique. We'll dig into it in a second, but what, what was the trigger for this movie for you? Uh, Julio Torres. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean it's still a beyond thrill for me to have anything to do with Julio. I love him. I mean, I always loved him, like a lot of people who've never actually uh, sat down with him uh, do. But, yeah, it's a, such a thrill to, uh, to, to call him comrade, because he's, he's next level. As, as those of you who know his work will know, but, but now he's a filmmaker, and that's really good for all of us who are interested in film. When we were here, we'll come back to Problemista in a minute, but when we were here nine years ago, you described cinema in a way that has stayed with me. You called, you called cinema a magic carpet. And I'd love to invite you to either expand on that notion or, or share with us whether that idea of this magic carpet, this cinematic magic carpet, has evolved for you in that almost 10 years, how you think about cinema today. It's very nice, this check-in with you, Eugene. And nine years is a, is a very particular, um, yeah, that's a particular time travel, thinking back nine years. Because, of course, in many ways, I feel more than ever that cinema is ever more magical and carpet-like. But we've got, you know, we've had different, um, not battles, but challenges, let's say, that euphemism for battle. Uh, <laughs> uh, we've, got, we, we have, we've had different challenges in the last few years, particularly. And some of them are, are, are lingering around people's belief in sitting in big spaces. Look at you, I bet you none of you are wearing masks as well. I mean, who knew that was gonna be possible? Um, yeah, there was a time very, I mean, in Texas, did people wear masks? I have to ask, <laughs> did they? <laughs> I don't know, it's a wide world and uh, people do things differently all over the place. Um, I'm actually just about to start shooting a picture in Ireland and I was told, full disclosure, and I'm sure this is being recorded, and people in Ireland might hear it, to wear a mask at all times. Um, and I'm not wearing a mask because I'm super healthy and I've had COVID so many times uh, and I'm so full of antibodies that I'm, and I have faith. 
Um, but it's very nice to see your faces unmasked. But yeah, a couple of years ago, we couldn't imagine sitting in a room like this, yeah. could we? And, and we did wonder, I, I did, I wondered how long it would be before the time we would be able to, and I did, I did have a concern that those who thought th that sitting in a big place to look at a big screen was a bit obsolete would kind of gain traction and that that would just tip it over the edge and people would just forget the power of the magic carpet. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a concern. But then this magical thing happened. You know, you asked anybody, not just cine nerds like us, what they really missed during the pandemic, and they said the same things. They said friends, family, live music, cinema. Those were the only things people missed. And a bit of travel as well, but you know, there's always uh, David Attenborough and cinema for that. <laughs> um, and, and then I thought, oh, this is interesting. This is the one good thing about the pandemic, is it's making people, you know, naysay the people who said that cinema was on the way out. It's, it's given it a bit of a boost. It's, it's a booster jet for our reliance on this drug of choice. And, and I feel we're in a very interesting moment. And that's why I mention um, the Oscars. Who knew I would ever mention the Oscars? But it's, it is important because, you know, everything, everything is a big film that you are better seeing on a big, film, on a big screen. And that's really good for our cause, that, that a lot of people heard its name and will now seek it out if they haven't seen it already. That's really good for cinema. So for the Oscars to be good for cinema, it's not always the case. Sometimes the Oscars isn't particularly good for big cinema. You know, it, it's, a, it's a bit of a crapshoot, isn't it? But I feel that the, it, this morning I feel like it's new balls. You know, it's a new game. And those of us who are really interested in big cinema and believe that it's good for people have a kind of better, you know, we've got a bit of, a bit of air today. We're in this, I agree with you, and we're in this special place, um, this communal experience of sharing something together, like this conversation, like the movies you're all watching this weekend. Um, I think festivals play, I'm, I'm biased because I work in the world of festivals, uh, you created a festival where you dragged a movie screen across the countryside. Um, so you must have um, a belief and investment in that, that idea of creating these beyond the, the daily movie-going experience at a, at a cinema, an art house, a multiplex, the, the notion of creating a special moment to build around introducing movies or looking back at ones from the past. Um, and how we need to preserve that. I was, I've been thinking a lot about how we need to preserve these opportunities um, because we did lose them for a little while and we're trying to figure out how to get them back and it's hard, but um, so rewarding, so exciting. Well, cinema is an event. I think that's the thing that the pandemic reminded people of that that's what people miss. They missed putting on their coat or not, if you live in Texas. Um, and. Um, <laughs> And, and going down, you know, walking or make, taking a trip, maybe deciding if you're going to eat something before, picking your snacks. But, you know, it's an event. It's a thing. Who are you going to sit with during, you know, who are you going to meet? Who are you going to fancy in the aisle? It's an event. It's not just um, turning on your screen on the end of your bed. It just isn't. It's a different thing, and we all love doing that, but it's not the event that cinema provides us with. And festivals, of course, are the, the event beyond all events, because what you're getting with festivals are, you know, you're, you're buying tickets for films, you don't know anything about them, you don't care at a festival. You just get the ticket, and you turn up, and you don't necessarily know which country this uh, film's from. You may never have heard of the country it's from. You, you may never have heard of anybody in it or anybody to do with the making of it, but you'll go because it's a festival, because you trust the curator, curators, and, and you'll go for the festival of it, the fiesta of it. The fiesta. Yeah. Yeah. How do you think about, how do some of these ideas that you're sharing with us now impact 
the decisions you make. You're, uh, Austin, the, uh, who was introducing our conversation, <clears throat> used the word performer to describe you. Um, I see you also as a, as a collaborator holding the hands of, of the artists who are involved in bringing a, a story to a, a screen. Um, how do you, are there ways that even the past few years or even in this past almost decade that you think about that, I'll use the word power that you have, you empower a story to, when, you're, when you decide to make a movie, Tilda, that puts it on a radar, even if it's a, someone who's never made a film before. So how do you think about the way you deploy that, that power or that opportunity that you can bring? I, I suppose the best way to approach answering that is to describe <clears throat> how I started uh, making work, um, which was collectively. I mean, I've always worked collectively, and that means not only that I've made cinema collectively, programmed and made festivals collectively, made artwork collectively, made music collectively, but also I really feel a part of the audience when I work, and so this is also a part of it, this, this um, conversation that we have. That's really important to me. I love festivals, not only, uh, I, you know, I have the great privilege and, and, and delight recently to be able to curate festivals, but I really love going to festivals. I love sitting in the audience. And I also don't mind sitting up here because I really love what we have, this conversation. Uh, I think that's, I love knowing that that many people are here to see films. I mean, it's, it's, it's good for me because it also reminds me that what I started with, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And I started working with Derek Jarman in the 80s in a collective way and worked only with him for nine years until he died in 94, um, although I did make Orlando during that time as well. But I was, I, we were working in this very, some might say, some did say then, and some might still say, very arcane way um, of all kind of smushing it up together and not really caring about the product and being much more interested in the process and all of that. Um, and when Derek died, there was really the possibility that that was it. And then I was high and dry. I had been making films for nine years, but I was certainly not a professional. And um, thought, okay, well, that's, that's it. And then miraculously met other people who wanted to work in this way. And so that's, you know, and every time I make a film, I want it to be my last film and I want to get on with the rest of my life. And then I get drawn into another conversation and another sort of party and on it goes. Um, but but that's, um, that's why I shy away from describing myself in any other way. I mean, performer is, if I could think of a better word, I, you know, I tried show pony once. Um, <laughs> but uh, I don't know, you know, in the olden days, you used to have to write on your passport what you were. And um, I would, could never write actor, partly because, like all of us, I've heard and read what I call real actors, talking about what they do and why they do it and how they do it. And I just, it's not my world. And so I, it, I would feel a fraud for, uh, for describing myself as an actor because my priorities seem to be quite different. And that's to do with my beginnings. Let's talk a little bit more about those beginnings. It's interesting to think about the notion of you collaborating with Derek Jarman making Orlando with Sally Potter, and then wandering off to something else. So two questions come from that for me. Um, what, what drew you to Derek and then to Sally at that stage in your life? And then what kept you coming back when you could have gone in another direction? What held you? Well, I, I've said this before, and I'll go on saying it because it goes on being true. I never wanted and I still don't want to be an actor. And I went to university as a writer. And that's what I'd always been. I even got my place as a writer. So I am a terrible failure because I, at the second I got to university, I stopped writing. And uh, yeah, it happens. 
yeah, no, it does. It happened. I'm, years later, I met my tutor, and I told her this with sort of great shame, and she was very flippant and said, oh, that's very, very usual. <laughs> awful. It's so awful, isn't it? Confidence. Yeah, they just like, <sighs> cut me. Anyway, I, um, I, I made some friends, like you do, and a lot of the friends that I made happened to be making theatre, in which I have very little interest. I never did. Um, but they were making plays, and there was no cinema. This was Cambridge University in England, and at that stage, there was no cinema. I think there now is. In fact, I had a very bittersweet moment when I was asked to go and open the, the film course there, and I felt oh, so torn between happy and bitter and because had it been opened in my time, I would have done film studies, and I would be a film critic, probably, now. <laughs> I don't know, but I mean, I, I was really interested in cinema always, not interested in theatre, not particularly interested in acting, and very interested in writing, so I don't know, something might have come out in the wash. Um, but my friends who were making plays, and uh, they asked me to kind of join them, and I liked them, I liked hanging out with them, so I kind of I directed a play first, and then I started performing in their plays. And I just went, went where the crack was. You know, I liked those people, and so I hung out with them. But I never thought of doing it after university. And then an agent met me and said, if you want to do it afterwards, I don't know, you're like sort of boring, sort of. I, and I just fell into it. And it's, I, I feel a little shame to say this, because I know that there are so many people who long to be actors and they are desperate to be able to say that an agent came to see them and asked if, to sign them. And, and, and I'm really, I'm sorry, I apologize for my good fortune, but I had that good fortune. I didn't want it, and this is the other thing about life. Sometimes you get somebody else's great good fortune and you have to kind of recycle it for your own purposes. And I, um, <laughs> I, I, so I, I started performing in the theater Learned nice and early what I w did not want to do. Uh, worked with the Royal Shakespeare Company, for example. Discovered that I absolutely didn't want to do that. That that time, I don't know. I just it, it just wasn't it wasn't me. And I and I was going to stop completely. And then I was asked to go and meet Derek Charman. And at that time, and this really is we're going back to the 13th century here. There wasn't really. I mean, there was no independent cinema in the UK, really. What there was, let me paint you a picture, there, were, there was Hollywood, but that was over the ocean, that was America. There was Europe, which was over another piece of water, and that was France and Germany, and, very, and Italy, and, very, and Spain, very interesting, but, but they had their own ways of funding their, their film, and we were... I was living in London, we were very London-centric, and there were a few international filmmakers, but they were very kind of proper professionals, like, believe it or not, David Lean was still making films, um, and then you had people like Merchant Ivory, who were making costume dramas, and I was absolutely certain that I didn't want to get drawn into that. Um, but I was, a lot of people were, um, and then there was a very, very, very active and brilliant television culture at the time. There were only four channels, and the BBC were amazing, and they did a lot of very amazing series and things, but a lot of actors were doing that. But independent cinema at the time hadn't really sort of, you know, it was, it was before Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> Harvey Weinstein came over, and he kind of, in many ways, kind of activated a different way of filmmaking in the UK, which was a bit of a dogleg and went up a sort of blind alley in a way. But anyway, the, there was one sort of stall in the fairground that made what I would call cultural film, and that was the British Film Institute. And they made films with people like Peter Greenaway, Derek Jarman, Sally Potter, Ron Peck, and they did this really beautiful thing. They would say, okay, Derek, um, I'll give you a little bit of money, 
like 200,000 pounds, which isn't very much, but I will support your next five films. I want your voice, I want to support you. It's not this project, it's you. And that was really the place. And um, Derek was flying a very particular flag at that time. He was, for these, those of you who don't know Derek Jarman's work, please seek it out. There was a time when I would mention his name in scenarios like this, and people hadn't heard of him. Recently, there's been all sorts of new efforts to make his work more visible. Um, he was an extraordinary, is an extraordinary example of absolutely self-determining, independent with a small I, I don't mean a capital I, he was completely uncoopted. He was a gay activist, writer, uh, gardener, painter, filmmaker, um, amazing person, and, and was one of the first people to come out publicly in 1989 and say that he had HIV and died of AIDS in 94. Uh, yeah, he's, he's the real deal. And uh, yeah, in 1985, he was making Caravaggio and he wanted to meet me. And that was just a very simple sort of meet cute. I went to meet him and we just adored each other and, and we just, I was with him until he died, basically, nine years later, yeah. Derek Jarman. Mm. You used the word um, confidence a minute ago. Mm. How has that word, how have you navigated confidence? Both the tilde you were talking about in meeting Derek Jarman, figuring out what you didn't want to do or what you did, and, and how does that notion of confidence, it's something that we all struggle with. How does that affect you today? Well, you know, here's the thing that I was thinking this morning in the bath, what what, what, in our catch-up, what might be a new thing to say? I say this, you know, humbly, because it may not be interesting to you, but I was thinking, what can I bring now that might be fresh to people of, an, of a younger generation? And there is something that, I, that occurs to me, uh, and, I, and I apologize if this isn't interesting or useful, but it might be, that um, when I was... It occurs to me that, that there is a sort of belief somehow that is in the water that when you make work, whatever it is, and you sort of get a little bit of visibility, you might make a film or you might write your first short story and have it published in a magazine or you might, um, whatever it is, you know, produce your first scarf, that at that point, all the focus is then on you as an individual and all the people who you needed to get you there fall away and the spotlight is on you and you've got to bring it by yourself. And it just occurred to me this morning that one thing that I can attest to and that I am actually a real poster child for is staying collective. You can do it that way. You don't have to get separated from your kin and your herd. You can keep collective and you can expand your collective and you can chop and change, and, but you can keep, keep that spirit. And I, the reason I mention this is that it occurred to me and I've had a number of young people ask me this recently. I think there is a sort of new virus in the air about being an individual, which frankly speaking, Eugene, people of our generation didn't have to deal with because there was, there was more um, respect for and investment in collective action. And I don't just mean political collective action, I mean, I mean artistic collective action. It was possible to talk this way then. But now I do feel that there is a pressure, very often felt by artists to cut ties, grow big balls, and be a narcissist, <laughs> you know? And I, and I don't, and, I, and that might put a lot of people off because they may not want to be that. They may want to stay connected and they may feel their creative vibe in a group. 
I'm definitely wired that way. I work with, the Germans have a word for it, Mitarbeiter. I am a Mitarbeiter. I work with. Even when I was asked to do this moment here, I said, if it's with Eugene, because I've done this once before with Eugene, this, is, this works, I want that. I, I, I find it, I'm not very good at being divided out. So I don't know if that's useful, and maybe I'm talking nonsense, but I've talked to enough younger artists recently about that particular pressure, and I would like to lead the, um, the charge for faith in collective comfort and support because it's real and I've done it for over 30 years I've just stayed close to my peeps and it's it, it, it's uh, yeah if that's the way you want it you can do it that way you don't have to you don't have to cut and run So in answer to your question, that's what confidence is for me. Thank you. Julio Torres has talked about <clears throat> something we heard folks talking about last night at the Oscars. Um, the notion of chasing an outlandish dream and that's an underpinning, that's part of what's at the heart of this movie, Problemista, which you have to see tonight. Sometimes the journey to a dream, to an outlandish dream, can seem impossibly difficult, even unattainable. And yet I also wonder if there's something essential in those obstacles. So this notion of dreams and obstacles, uh, does this resonate? I see it in the film. Yeah, I mean, that's really what this film is about. But I think it's about something else which mean, is meaningful to me in my life. Um, again, full disclosure, when we talk about dreams, when I think about dreams in my own life, I was asked not long ago about ambition, and I had to be honest, because I'm not a good liar, that I my ambitions when I was a young person had nothing to do with making work, or rather, you know, I had no dream, as I've already described, to be an actor, for example. I certainly had never stood in front of a mirror with a, ha with a, ha a hairbrush, um, practicing any kind of awards speeches or any of that. My ambitions were to live in Scotland, where I'm from. By the way, I'm so grateful to that piper. How magical was that? That's where I come from. So come over and see if you haven't been already, because it's all that good stuff. Um, live in Scotland, live by the sea, have a garden that I could grow vegetables in, have some children and some dogs and work with my friends. And I didn't mind what that was. It could have been working in a wool shop, or it could have been having a small holding, or it could have been having a kind of village magazine. I didn't care, but th that was my formula. And that's been really useful to have that ambition, because number one, I'm very happy to say I've achieved all those goals, um, but not having a kind of dream that's got edges, that's brittle and breakable, that you can fail at, I think is a good thing. Because if you pitch yourself, if your dreams are process, it's what I was saying about, you know, working with Derek and learning at the knee of Derek. If your, if your dreams are at, pitched at process and maybe things like good company, all the challenges, all the nightmares, <laughs> all the bankruptcies, and I mean, I'm not, I'm not, you know, wanting to diminish or minimize the tough stuff in life, but there's no question that good company definitely helps the bad stuff. And so to pitch yourself at that first and foremost, personally, I think is a good call. Um, 
so there's, you, you have to be canny with your dreams. You know, make sure you don't put your dream too far out of reach that's going to hurt you because, because it's just not, you're not going to be able to grow to it. And then make the process part of the dream and enjoy the ride. There's no doubt about it. The really, I have a, you know, when people say they're making a movie and, or, or, or an album, they, oh my God, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day who's working on an album, it's the 10th year. That's nothing for me. I've made films that took, I mean, I made a film last year that I was talking to my friend Cynthia Beat about for 30 years, and we finally shot it last November. You know, films, the, the film I made with Upper Chapong where it's vertical, the Memoria, we talked about for 17 years. It's fine, it's the journey and it evolves during that. If you set yourself the task to write that novel in a year or to write that album and put it out and win a Grammy or whatever, be careful because that stuff's breakable, that's shatterable. Keep your dreams soft and malleable and flexible and porous and fun. <laughs> that's what I say. Thank you for spending this time with us today. <clears throat> we have a few questions that you've sent in, and I've, we've got a few of them in front of us here. Um, so we'll take a couple of questions and we'll keep talking. Um, let's see. Uh, Luciano Matias, are you here somewhere? Um, I would like to know what was, oh, let's see, where we go. I would like to know what was, is your feeling about the film? The Last and First Man, a touching film with a completely different narrative. This is a really um, precious film that uh, was made by a friend um, at a particular moment in his life. He's no longer with us, so it's his um, parting gift, and it's uh, of particularly, I've been thinking about it recently because it's about, um, and I provided the voice for this film. It's an, anim to call it an animated film is, feels um, a little reductive. Uh, it's an imaginary uh, fantasy film. And um, it's about uh, life beyond, it's about life in, you know, 200 years. And, and being up on what I call the objectivity cloud and looking down and, and seeing what we made of the planet. And I'm thinking of it particularly at the moment because I'm actually next Monday starting to shoot a film uh, called The End, imaginatively enough, about uh, the end of the world. Um, it's about the richest family in the world living in a bunker under middle America. Um, surrounded by all their art. <laughs> and it's a musical. <laughs> and it's made by Joshua Oppenheimer, who made the great documentaries, uh, The Act of Killing and uh, The Look of, the, what's it called, The Look of Silence? So, uh, the, 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 I, I've forgotten all the second one. Okay, scrap that if you're, if you're streaming it. Um, I can't remember his second film, but anyway, this is his third. And it's, anyway, so I think about the, the first and last men a lot, um, but it's, uh, it's anybody wants to, to find that film. Um, what can I say about it? It's a little, um, sorry, Luciano, I'm not really um, digging deep for you. It's a beautiful thing, and I hope you feel the same, um, but it's a trip, and it's a trip that we're probably all taking one way or another at the moment, thinking about what might be left behind in 100, 500 years. Um, but it's nourishing, I think, to, to, to have these thoughts and, and think about them while, while we've still got something going. And, and you got Josh's film correct, The Look of Silence. The Look of Silence, thank God for Check that. Check them out. Uh, let's see, let's take a few more questions. <clears throat> what's the thing you look, what's the thing that you look for in a character that makes you say yes to a project? Well, not surprisingly, I don't really look at the character first. I always choose the people first. Um, and then 
And usually there's a relationship, not always, because sometimes I'll meet somebody um, for a project and then we just start nattering and then it will develop out of that conversation, what I might do. But the character is not usually the place I go, not being an actor. Um, but there's something that I am really interested in, in general, which is transformation. I mean the fact of transformation. I'm not talking about just the dressing up aspect. I mean the fact that we all transform all the time. And as um, wiser people than I uh, put our attention on and have done for years, ch, -ch changes they are what we know, they're all we have. We don't really have anything else to rely upon. And the quicker and the more gracefully we can acknowledge that, the better. So I like, if we're talking about narrative, I'm particularly interested in people. I don't really like talking about characters because that feels like it's a bit, a bit of a theatrical term, but the portraits of people who find themselves on precipices in their lives when they have to transform um, or they find themselves naturally transforming and they have to accept that transformation. Um, so whether it's, for example, as in Orlando, uh, a young man who wakes up a woman one day and is, by the way, the same person, just a different sex, um, or whether it's um, a totally out of control alcoholic who kidnaps a child and yet finds herself becoming effectively a mother, really becoming overtaken by a mother's love for this victim in her hands and the boot of her car, or, or whatever. You know, this feeling of us being blown off course by life into a change. That's really interesting to me. And uh, I like to navigate that. I, it's all about identity. I've never really been, I'm, I'm not a big believer in identity. I don't know that we ever should feel the pressure to identify ourselves as one thing with a sort of you know, menu attached. Because life's way too interesting for that. And we are morphing all the time. So. The, 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 the more easily we can just ride that horse all the way and enjoy all the different landscapes that it will take us on um, and through and past, uh, the better. That's just going to be the easier way to go. I think the fight, all the stress and strain and incredible pain uh, that come, that, that humans it's so very touching the way humans can create these terrible problems. We take this, this burden of identifying ourselves, I think, is, uh, is too much. I think we should be easier on ourselves. I'm going to pick up on that thread of transformation um, and call back to, we were here together on the stage a smaller room. Um, this room is big. Uh, ten year, almost ten years ago, nine years ago. How do you think you've changed, evolved in that almost ten years? Do you think about that at all? Do you see, do you see transformation in your own life and in yourself? And if so, how do you That's a, navigate it? I love that question. I, I don't know what the answer is. Um, let me think. Um, nine years. Wow. Okay. So. Nine years ago, the biggest change I would, apart from just trying to um, keep my ears open to the rest of the world, um, I would say in my own life, my children were whatever, 16, and they're now 25. And that's a big change for 20, well, I mean, I'm still looking after them, of course. But uh, uh, no, they are, they are, if I fall down a manhole today, I can tell you there's two great humans on the planet who are um, delivered. I delivered them, they're doing their thing. Um, <laughs> I'm happy to say, and they're completely self-sufficient and that's a really good feeling. Um, so that's a big, big change because for 20 whatever, one years of those, I felt 
I was, uh, that was my main focus, being there for them and just, you know, sweeping the temple and lighting the candles and staying out the way. But, but now I'm um, released, and that's what happens, you know, when they grow up, those children. It's kind of unfortunate to say that they are as uh, flown as they are. It's a good feeling. It's a lovely thing to know that they're off. Uh, doing their thing. My son is a props guy. He's working on the Bob Marley biopic. He's in Jamaica right now. And he sent me this fabulous photograph of himself on the top of a banana truck. And I felt so proud. I thought that's, he's launched, you know, isn't that great? <laughs> yeah. And my daughter is just studying for her final. She's preparing her dissertation. I can't believe I'm being so... This is very embarrassing for them that I'm talking about them on this stage. <laughs> but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on. I've done one. With twins, you have to, if you do with one, you have to do with the other. Yes. She, um, she's doing her dissertation for her finals in psychology at, at Edinburgh. And she's writing about beauty standards. She's dope. Switching gears entirely. <clears throat> That's amazing. Dan Cullen Shute says um, and asks, a video of you reacting to some latte art went viral. <laughs> the, <laughs> you've seen it. The purity of your joy and excitement was genuinely intoxicating. Why did that moment, what was it about that moment that lit you up so? What, what's not amazing about that thing? I mean, what have I missed? Is everybody just very cool about that? It's amazing. Did you see it? How did he do it, that guy? Do people just, is, is, am I just, we just don't do that in the Highlands. <laughs> I thought it was amazing. I still think it's amazing. And I think it's amazing that people thought me finding it amazing is amazing. I mean. Amazing. Um, <clears throat> two questions are related, uh, one from Gabriel Dietrich, Dietrich and one from Carlos Parada. Uh, you've been a longtime advocate for the LGBTQ plus community and <laughs> and other marginalized groups. How do you see your platform as an artist contributing to social change, A? And did you get in trouble for supporting LGBTQ rights in Russia? Thank you for supporting our community. Uh, it is my honor. This is my community we're talking about. And I really meant it when I said before that I think that, that the, it's meaningful when I say it's my community. I, not just because I was like some sort of babe in the wood who was, you know, at a young age discovered by some wonderful queer people and taken under their wing. It's not just that, although it is a lot to do with that. I mean, I, I, when I started working with Derek and living alongside him and our world, and it was our world, it was a natural home for me and is still my natural home. So I really feel um, that it's my community. But I didn't feel adopted, if you like. I really feel that it was always a tribe I was looking for. Um, because it's about flexibility, and it's about fantasy, and it's about dreaming as well. Um, so, yeah, it's, it would be absurd and inaccurate and unthinkable for me not to authentically represent uh, the, that community. Um, as for Russia, well, that's, I mean, I don't even know what to say about Russia. Um, I made a gesture, a small gesture, which was 
perceived as, as, as supportive, of course, but it, it was terrifying then to make that gesture, which was, for those of you who don't know, I, 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 took, I went to Russia for, for an event, and the reason I decided to, to do the event was so that I could take a rainbow flag in my luggage and, and hold it up in Red Square. Big deal. It was a huge deal. I had my 15-year-olds with me at the time, and I was very frightened that um, I might have them taken off me for doing it. And as we held it out, it was a matter of you know, four seconds to take this photograph. A police car came up behind me. It's actually in the photograph. And we had to wait until the plane was actually taking off before posting the photograph. That's a long time ago. Things are so much worse now. I mean, we can't even go down that rabbit hole. But it, it's incredibly important, I realize, to make these gestures. I don't know, it's funny, this question of platform, it just occurs to me, it's, if one has, you know, I make public work, and I'm invited to sit here with a friend in pink socks um, and talk to you people and that's or talk with you people I would say and that's wonderful what's the value of it I suppose it's company I suppose it's just um, being one less person in the public eye who's not connected to us you know, is that it? Is that me? If that's all it is, then it's still worth something, I suppose. Um, I suppose there is a way in which we could see the world as only providing us people in the public eye who we can't imagine sitting down with and having a cup of tea. Um, but anyway, you know, as long as it's possible to stay connected and connected with people sitting on, on a stage with lights on them, then that's going to be a that's going to be a good thing. And 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 if it's um, people who may in their own lives feel levels of alienation, persecution, general deep deep upset and doubt about the goodness of humankind, if it can help that for a second, then then. Let's, let's just keep talking. I don't, do, I don't know what else to say. It's, a, it's an honor for me to be given these opportunities to just, you know, have a, have a moment of connection. And, you know, we're all in the same boat. Everybody is in the same boat, really. And these lights don't mean that much. It just means you can see us better. You can see Eugene's socks better. Um, I mind that I can't see you, but that's the way it all works. Um, but representing, what, what are we doing? Representing just people who want to talk, really, not, not necessarily any one community. We're all here in one boat, I would say. Thanks for spending this time with us. We have a few more minutes and a few more questions. Um, I might change one word in this question, Shalina Basin, but what's a project that you've worked on regardless of its success? And the question is, that has meant the most to you? We talked about maybe not emphasizing the word best, so that is. That's lovely, meant a I lot like that question. You. I can tell you very quickly what that is, and it's the last film that we made and was released, which is a film that I made with my dear friend Joanna Hogg um, called The Eternal Daughter, also um, produced and distributed by the great, great A24. Um, and uh, this is a film that's very tender to us. Um, Joanna Hogg, if you don't know, uh, she's, a, she's a really extraordinary filmmaker. I made I mean, she, I've known her since I was 10. Uh, she's literally my oldest friend. And I made her a uh, graduation film with her. And she made two films a few years ago, uh, the souvenir films. They were conceived as two films. So there's souvenir one and souvenir two, but souvenir two is not a sequel. It, they are one film in two parts. And um, 
the protagonist in those films is played by my daughter, the dope one. Um, <laughs> although she's now doing her psychology degree, like a sensible person. Um, and uh, this film that Joanna and I made, uh, The Eternal Daughter, is not a sequel to those films, but it does involve the same people that were in the souvenir films. 25 years later, in the souvenir films, Joanna uh, Honor plays a, a, a character called Julie, who's very, very loosely based on Joanna, and I play her mother. And in this film, The Eternal Daughter, it's 25 years later, and I play them both. And it's such a tender film for Joanna and I. We made it during lockdown. It was, you know, it was like 25 people in a house for a couple of months. And it was really about our mothers and about our relationship. Well, relationships, but in a way that the sort of primal relationship that we both agreed was pretty much the same with both our mothers. And um, yeah, I love that film. I love it partly, not just because of what it is about, but it gave me the opportunity, really, I don't know how many people saw it, but to show kind of what I mean when I say I'm not an actor, because the entire film is improvised, which means that I'm actually improvising with myself. And it actually made, you know, it drew on the writer in me because it means that the text is something that I'm coming up with and the conversation is between myself and myself. And uh, it was such a joy to make it, but it was also a kind of proof in a way to myself that this grain of performance, unscripted, un varnished was really what I'm interested in. And I'd worked on a film before that with, I mentioned it earlier, Memoria, with Apa Chapong Weir Etzetical, which was also kind of alongside, nice clap, uh, <laughs> alongside this, dealing with the same sort of grain of performance. And this grain of performance is something I'm really interested in. Uh, you know, I'm very happy to play a grotesque for Bong Joon-ho or Wes Anderson, um, and I will continue to, do, to go to those parties. But this grain that we worked with on The Eternal Daughter is, is something I'm really interested in. So, um, yeah, I would say that, Phil. Check it out, please. I'm going to do two more. Natasha Peach, you're up next. You end this question with a heart instead of a question mark. Please, t please tell us about your jumper. Thank you for this question, Natasha. <laughs> give, you the op my, the op give me the opportunity to tell you about my jumper. Um, there's a really wonderful um, Scottish designer um, called Charles Jeffrey. His uh, house is called Loverboy. And I am a rocking lover boy today. And yes, it's even got it written on it. In fact, what I'm wearing, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I'm going to tell you because I'm here for him. Um, and I'm going to wear him tonight as well. Uh, what I'm wearing comes from a collection that he presented in Milan in January, which is entirely inspired by my children's father, who is an amazing Scottish artist called John Byrne, a figurative artist who was born in 1940 and was an old Ted Teddy boy. And so uh, all, everything that in that collection was inspired by John, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna wear a kilt tonight with his, one of his paintings on it. So. Oh. <clears throat> okay, one more from Sergio Leva. Having discovered so many things that you don't wanna do as a performer, what is truly tickling your fancy right now, Tilda, and where do you think your art is headed? Another great question. I mean, I kind of answered it before when I talked about the grain of the eternal daughter. I think this exploration of how little can performance be, how porous and, and responsive. And I'm speaking as an audience now. I have to confess that I really hate seeing acting. I don't like it. I don't like seeing grandiose gestures 
and um, performative performance. I think you know what I mean by that. I just, it, I, I like to see, this is why I love documentary so much. I like to see people like me now, who knows sort of what I want to say but can't quite find the words. I like this mess and inarticulacy and, you know, sort of, yeah, I, 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 the, 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 the cleanness of a sort of grand, dramatic performance. Don't, don't get me, I'm afraid. And so it's very interesting to me to just experiment with how, um, how to work with inarticulacy. And improvising is, is one way. So I am very interested in that. Um, um, and I say this as a joke, I mean as a joke. I am singing in this musical about the end of the world, and that's tickling me. Um, I say it as a joke because don't expect anything, because I'm like, a, you know, the last time I sang really was in my children's carol concerts at school, so it's, it's nothing. But it's such fun as a, as a beginner to go every day to... Uh, to work and sing, warm up, doing warm ups with voice coaches and things. I mean, I'm loving that. It's not, it's not going to go anywhere. I'm not bringing out any albums, but it's really, <laughs> really good fun. So I love that. And just, and just seeing, staying open and seeing what the next bend brings, I think. Well, one thing that the next bend brings for this audience is the opportunity to see a truly special, unique, and exciting new work tonight. You'll be the first audience to watch it, Problemista, tonight at the Paramount, I think at 9.30. Um, I do hope you'll have a chance to see that and there'll be a conversation after the screening. Um, what I love about South By is the opportunity to sit and, and exchange ideas and to be inspired, um, to be moved and intrigued by the conversations that happen around the creativity that we see uh, in this city during this festival and year round, of course. So I wanna thank our guest today, Tilda Swinton, for spending this time with us, spending this hour um, and being so thoughtful and so generous with your time. It's my honor.